Hi, my name is Karat, and this is uh, Ali Ben. We're from Princeton University. Today, we're going to be talking about annotating the classics, uh, a platform for multimedia annotations of classic texts. And we come to you from from what's called the um, McGraw Center for Teaching and Learning at Princeton University. Uh, we're not um, faculty at Princeton. We're also not really IT support. We're more like educational technology support. And, uh, and that's a very important uh, role that we feel uh, at Princeton. Um, and this project that we'd like to try to describe today um, is a good example of the kind of interplay that we experience between the faculty experience and the educational technology experience. And we're, this is going to be our agenda. We're going to give you a little background about Princeton, um, about McGraw, about the course itself, EAS uh, 233, about the blended design, uh, and we're going to touch a little bit about the traditional, uh, about how the course was originally taught, and then the blended design, and then Ben is going to show the site demonstration that we've ran for the past three years, and then he's developed a new tool uh, for this coming fall. Now this is a, um, uh, a blended learning kind of uh, website, uh, basically, for this course, but it, it also reflects one of the things that we try to, or that we're very interested in, which is building a resource over the years. Um, so this started back in 2014, it was the brainchild of a, of a graduate student at the time who was teaching this survey course in, in introductory East Asian humanities. And we found great success, we'll talk more about it in a, in a while, but um, we found great success in other projects because the McGraw Center that we come from works with faculty uh, across the discipline. It's mostly in the humanities, but across the entire university. Um, we found great success in the kinds of projects that um, have consistency across the years across the semester, so that students feel they are contributing to some sort of larger project. And this, this sort of idea has sort of grown out of the development of a digital humanities center on campus as well. And about four years ago, we started the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton. And that's kind of, uh, that's, caused kind of interest in building these pedagogical projects, not just research projects, but digital pedagogy projects that span the years. So because many people might not think of Princeton as a typically liberal arts college, certainly not a small liberal arts college, we thought it might be useful to talk a little bit about Princeton and why why we were at a small liberal arts college. <laughs> so we're, we're considered uh, a, a research institution, um, but Princeton has the mindset of a small liberal arts college. Any student that comes to Princeton uh, essentially drives their own path to whatever they want to take and, and whatever they want to learn, um, and then they can build uh, their thing from there, they choose a major, and then they go on. But, um, but research is, is, is still at the heart of it, even though um, you, you still have that uh, dichotomy. So by the numbers, um, Princeton has uh, 5,277 undergraduates, 2,697 graduates, and 96% of the students live on campus. Uh, there's 76% that receive um, bachelor's of arts, and the other 24% um, receive a uh, bachelor's in engineering. So, and most go on to Wall Street. <laughs> but it's a little strange to only have two degrees, right? And, and that's kind of just window dressing. Uh, people, the students have concentrations, which kind of uh, are the equivalent of a major at another university or part of college. Um, but these are the two types, the two tracks that students take, either Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor in Science, basically. And engineering is really, really popular, and computer science, of course. But you can see the arts are also, the liberal arts are also very, very popular with the liberal arts 
Uh, the ratio uh, between uh, faculty and students is 5 to 1, and 40% of the students are minorities. And now we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, who we are and, and what we do. Um, our group, the McGraw Center for Teaching and Learning, is comprised of 20 individuals, um, and they're broken down into five subdivisions. Uh, undergraduate and graduate tutoring, uh, teaching initiatives program, online learning environments, the English language program, uh, educational and classroom technologies, and we also have a physical lab called the Digital Learning Lab, uh, which Ben and I are part of. So this, um, we're part of this educational classroom technologies group, and it's worth talking a little bit about the history of that and the, what I see as the importance of that in the, in the structural, um, the support structures available for faculty in digital projects such as this. Um, we, we've been around for a very long time, but until that Digital Humanities Center was formed, we were involved in supporting faculty research digitally, we were involved with pedagogical teaching projects, um, websites, blogs, databases, you name it, and a um, pretty small group, actually. Um, but um, now we, we moved to the McGraw Center for Teaching and Learning, and we're able to focus more specifically on the teaching aspects of, of digital work. Um, and uh, we also, in support of that, have this digital learning lab, which allows us to bring classes into a, um, a cutting-edge uh, multimedia computer studio that allows faculty to um, more opportunities in, in doing digital projects. And we'll just jump into our project, which is uh, East Asian Studies 233. The course is traditionally taught and is intended to give students an introduction to the literature, religion, philosophy, and art of East Asia, uh, including China, Korea, and Japan, from the earliest times until the end of the 14th century. The course focuses on cultural connections between uh, three countries and how, common, and how the common themes are uniquely within each culture. Um, so, the, so, so why is blended learning required in this course? Well, this course for a very long time was traditionally taught, and the course generally enrolls about anywhere between 15 to 20 students. Um, however, uh, over the course of time, um, surveys have showed a decline in, um, in East Asian studies uh, in, in this particular course. And so, as Ben indicated earlier, there was a graduate student who wanted to revamp this course to look at it in a different way pedagogically. So he came to us one day and he said, you know, I have an idea and I want to bring change to this course in order to raise engagement, in order to, to, to try to bring new blood back into, in, into uh, the classics. So that's exactly um, what he did. So you can see a few of the different motivations here. Um, previously, I talked about our motivation in building projects that kind of span the years so that students feel as if they're contributing to larger projects. Uh, and we've been successful with those types of things in the past, but there's also other motivations here. The graduate student who originally came up with the idea for the project um, or the revamped course um, was was interested in the in the digital humanities component of it, right? Um, and also interested in um, motivating the students. But the thought that if something's digital, maybe the students will be interested, more interested in it. From the department chair's perspective, it's um, we have declining enrollments in this course. Maybe if the students like their websites and things, maybe we'll get more students. Right? That's that's a um, not the best way to look at digital work, <laughs> but it's certainly one of those motivators that we see all the time. Um, this um, the revamped course. Um, it does change the way the course is taught, but we're under real maybe constraints at Princeton University. Um, the tradition weighs on people's shoulders. Um, 
And this is still somewhat of a lecture course. A lot of the faculty members were trained in that lecture um, mentality and um, still see that as, a, as an extremely valuable way to teach. And who are we to, to disagree? Um, but um, this also brings in some blended learning components, and it's, it's a start for an institution like Princeton. So you originally taught this course. Um, this course is uh, given uh, in the fall of, of every year, and he originally taught this course in the fall of 2013 with only eight students. So what he wanted to do was his idea was to create, was allow students to create digital projects and be able to uh, publish their articles online in conjunction with their readings. Um, he also wanted to augment the course materials by linking and drawing correlations between the, the various texts uh, from, from various cultures. And, um, and then he wanted to also uh, allow his pe uh, the, the students and their peers to create projects and, and writing articles and sharing them with, between each other. Um, we, we've noticed that, and, and research has shown, that if peers write uh, in, for, for the public or, or for their peers, they tend to write better than if they were to write uh, to the faculty member. Uh, because they have to see their peers every day, and faculty members they only see for that one semester and then they're gone. So when he started in 2013, he only had eight students, and in uh, 2014 there were thir uh, there were 13 students, 2015 there were 12, and then 2016 there were 20 students. So we see this fluctuation, but definitely more uh, than when the class was taught traditionally. And the chair of the department was happy. Mm -hmm. So. He came to us, and um, here are oops, uh, the, the aims of the site. First, as Ben indicated, is to create an online space where, um, where the humanities, um, where East Asian humanities, uh, by intersecting the digital text and media, to create online articles and projects. Next, he wanted uh, student assignments to not only simply functions as means uh, for the instructors to judge comprehension, but allow the students to create the bulk of the content. And lastly, by linking their assignments and passages uh, in digital form to the actual text that was there. So the way the graduate student who initially came up with the idea described it was as a DH laboratory. Um, which sounds great, um, but what is that? What is a laboratory online? And what is a laboratory in the humanities? Certainly it's easy to say, well, the, the library is, is the laboratory in the humanities, and that's, that's true. Um, but in a graphically rich, and that's an understatement, um, in subject matter such as East Asian humanities that has such rich um, graphical resources, and the library has such great resources, and the museum has such great resources, and we want to bring all these things together, you can start to think of an online space where students might be able to start manipulating the media. So to say it's a laboratory for uh, scholarly work in the humanities is um, a bit of an overstatement, but um, we want students to be able to manipulate the media in some way, to work with the media. In addition to experiencing um, the media firsthand, and that's, that's one of the real benefits of, of being at a place like Princeton University. We have wonderful resources in rare books, um, in the library, in the museum, and, and, and certainly a, part of, a necessary component of a course like this is students going and actually not touching, but looking at those resources. But um, we can bring those resources also, facsimiles of those resources, into a, an online space in which students can, in some ways, manipulate those media elements. And so with the writing, he came to us with this. And he says, I would like a site made. And this is what he came up with. 
So from this sketch and the, 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 the two paragraphs that he provided us, um, we came up with this. So before we jump into the demo, um, I just want to uh, just give a little overview about uh, how the site currently functions, or functions in uh, 2014, 2015, and 2016 with uh, variations. So at the very top bar, you have the overall grouping. You have the syllabus that uh, the students can go to and look at it from time to time. You have the project hub. And the project hub is essentially the three themes that the course goes through um, every year. Um, and then secondly, the texts are associated to those project hubs. So with every, so you can think of it as categories and then um, for each category under the text you have sections. And then to support the text, you have images. Because these texts go for pages and pages and pages, which we'll show you in a minute. Um, but we wanted to separate the images just in case that the students wanted to um, write about the imagery or do research about the imagery, then they can just focus on the imagery and not the text or draw correlations between text and imagery. And then lastly, we have um, resources, and which, which are essentially just links to outside resources and participants. And on the left, as they go through the, 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 the project hub, the text, and the images, on the left-hand side, you have the categories of annotation, guidelines, projects, responses, and uncategorized. So these categories, um, and, and you see the numbers uh, in there, is that they start filling up throughout the course of the semester as students uh, begin to annotate through the text. Um, the guidelines are there uh, as for, for the students uh, from the faculty members to, to give students um, support as they're, as they're going through the process. The project is their final projects where they don't do it individually, but they're going through it as, um, as, as, as a group. So maybe two to three in a group and they come up with their final projects. And then um, the responses comes from reading the, the text and writing a response, and they can then draw their own correlations. And then uncategorized was just there because students didn't uh, bother to tag it. So that's why it's there. So this this last Tuesday on campus for us was what's called Dean's Date. And that's the date on which uh, students, at about 5 o'clock, have to submit their final papers, which is a funny day, because you see students running all over the campus with these papers in their hands. Um, and uh, after five o'clock, the campus changes completely, <laughs> you might imagine. Um, but this, this course was very much restructured. There are no paper papers anymore. Um, there are just four components to the grading of the course. There are the annotations, which students are expected to annotate, multimedia annotate uh, the readings. Um, so they're not annotations in the sense of just comments. They're, they're longer form, thought out, uh, multimedia enhanced annotations of the readings. Um, there, that's about a quarter of the grade. Um, a response to essays that are also hosted on the site, um, usually about the readings, but sometimes about film uh, or about art. Um, so they're expected to write slightly longer form responses to those. Those also get posted on this site. And finally, the group projects, um, which occur at the end of the semester. Um, students are expected to that. That's about a quarter, and then a participation grade of the, the final quarter of the grade, roughly a quarter of each. Do you want to give me a Sure. So we um, like the idea of building these resources over the years, as I said. We've run into some impediments along the way, right? as, as is to be expected. Um, we now have four different sites for the four times that this course, or three times it has been offered, and one more this coming fall. Um, and that's mainly because the um, teaching staff has changed. So they have different readings that they want to focus on, and uh, that's been a bit of a challenge. So I think this project is, is as much about challenges as it is about successes. 
and hopefully we can learn from the challenges as well. Um, so we, Surat and I, in this educational classroom technologies group, we provide uh, WordPress support. Uh, we, we host the WordPress platform that is used for almost everything we do. Um, but we also have uh, the ability to build new plugins for WordPress and develop WordPress for whatever purposes we want. And this is an example of one of those plugins that we've developed in order to give it the functionality that we're interested in. And what were we interested in? We were interested in uh, being able to annotate the readings, right? being able to attach those responses to the essays they're responding to, in essence, to build these linkages. Right? And that's an essential component of uh, what might be thought of as an online laboratory, is to be able to build those links between ideas, be able to juxtapose images, juxtapose images, uh, um, resources, um, and to post your writing. So that the linking of things uh, was a necessary component. You might think, well, why don't you put that into a wiki? Because um, wikis are built like that. They build a network of information as you add more pages to it. And that would have worked very well. But um, to be honest, we found um, students are really turned off by wikis. Uh, they see them as old-fashioned and um, not attractive. And um, so that's kind of a cosmetic, uh, aesthetic turn off. Um, so that's really the only reason we didn't go with the wiki. Uh, but we do have the ability to develop some projects in-house. So we've done that. Um, Shiji might be a good example. So the plugin that we developed allows the instructors put the readings online, and they can insert in those readings uh, locations, kind of anchor points on which students can annotate or make connections to other pages in the blog. Otherwise, it's just your normal WordPress blog. The students have the ability to create posts, and those posts can be annotations, those posts can be responses, or those posts can be projects. And just to interject a, um, a little bit, uh, each annotation uh, is, is broken down into, and, and multiple annotations can be done per paragraph, uh, just in case the, the student felt that that one paragraph had a significant play um, on, on another uh, writing. So the students can go here and they can find the post that they've created, and I'm actually Answer. And add that to. So I just added this this uh, link to that project. So we're building the kind of network of these things, um, and quite simply, that's what uh, existed for the last three years or so. Um, we've we've added some things for this next upcoming uh, semester that I'll show you as well find some more examples. This is from the first time the course was offered. And you can see that the students were quite active in inserting these. And we wanted them to be able to insert annotations on specific paragraphs. So if you were to go into the, the editing mode of this page as the instructor, you can create what's called a short code um, that you insert in any place in this text um, that creates this anchor point and allows students to then link in. That's one thing I should mention. Um, and clicking that goes to that student's article. So this, the, the new version of this for 2017 um, has some additions.
see if I were logged in. Uh, software options like Scalar or another exhibition? Um, we have been flirting with Omeka and Scalar. Um, they just haven't, um, yeah, they haven't been adopted as much as um, these other ones. Okay. In the basement here, I'm not able to log in. So, um, well, the, the features that we've added for this upcoming one is the ability for students to remove those annotations which we didn't have before and also um, when you link to another page a listing of all the pages that um, link to that page is, is there so you really get a sense for this kind of network of different information and once you do something like that just for kicks and I haven't shown this to the faculty members yet, you can generate a map of the linkages between those things. And I, I don't know yet what the benefits of something like this might be, um, other than being pretty neat. Um, but that's that's a lot of the process, right? You, a lot of times you want to ask those questions after you've prototyped something, after you've tried. So you could show it to a faculty member and say, is this of interest to you? And once you have your information in a networked structure, we can play around with things like this. Um, but because students are more uh, visually uh, inclined now, um, having a, a graph like this, can uh, students can then draw correlations or, or new correlations between uh, certain texts. So, um, I also wanted to kind of generalize this a little bit. So this plugin is now um, not specific to the East Asian humanities at all. Uh, the, the tags that show up when somebody annotates them are simply the categories that they have assigned to those posts within WordPress. This just simply reflects whatever is linked within that. So hopefully we'll be able to use this kind of annotation linking Plugin. We need a catchier name for it, I think. Um, for other types of courses, right? Because this suggests, I feel, this suggests some ways that a humanities um, learning laboratory might take form online, where students are collecting texts, collecting multimedia joining them together in different ways, and then being able to automatically visualize the relationships between those things. Um, that's high in the sky. Um, there were some challenges that would be worth pointing out here um, along the way. As we hinted at before, um, there I, I feel there was some thought that uh, just having a digital component to the course would cause the enrollment to go up by itself. And I think this is a notion that we run into quite a bit. Um, that instructors think that students these days are digital natives and they get it and they're, they want to do this stuff. Uh, but generally, students, as, as just as faculty, are very comfortable with the lecture format students are also very comfortable with the lecture format, right? It's in their comfort zone. Um, so just because something's digital does not necessarily make it appealing automatically to students. Right? There are a lot of benefits to using a digital platform, but the fact that it's digital has not been. Uh, although the, the enrollment has gone up, so I'm not so sure. Um, so the uh, project work also, having group projects, is not appealing to students initially, 
um, they don't want to have to depend upon other students for their grade. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think after the fact, after they've done those projects, in retrospect, they do find some value in that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it takes some persuasion. Um, we, in a, from a support standpoint, the people who support these things, there's a lot of hand-holding that also has to happen. A couple of years we offered this. We didn't go in and suggest any platforms that students might use for their projects. Um, and they, they came up with some beautiful projects, I should say. Um, but mostly they used two or three platforms out there. They used Timeline.js, uh, which is a, a, a timeline, an illustrated timeline. Maybe I can bring some up. They used Prezi, which you may be familiar with, for making animated presentations. Which is their band of course. <laughs> Here's an example of Timeline.js. Mm -hmm. right. And they used Google My Maps. They're all terrific platforms and very easy for students to get started with. Um, they really made some beautiful timelines. The, the faculty member has uh, since told me that uh, he doesn't want to see Prezi ever again. <laughs> um, and so we're looking for more suggestions of what we might um, suggest to students in the future. Uh, Timeline.js has worked very well. Google My Maps does work, I mean, it works perfectly. Um, and so we're looking for other ones. Uh, there, there's a um, there's another project from Northwestern University, a sister project to Timeline.js that would look Story Maps JS that would work well. There is the Esri Online, the ArcGIS Online Story Maps uh, platform, and uh, there's Palladio, which is a uh, platform for for graphing, uh, for network graphs and for uh, geographic mapping as well, and I think we'll suggest in the fall. Uh, but the key point is uh, we really need to make sure we go in and give the students options because, again, you can't just assume that the students um, know about this. So, so um, I think we'll leave it at that so we leave some uh, time for questions. Do you have anything more, Sam? Thank you. Thank you.